we built in an automatic check that ensures samples are clean prior to imaging, um, which is necessary to preserve our data integrity. So that's sort of the whole idea of how, you know, what can we do to make sure that the samples are clean before <laughs> we image them. So, and this gets at, you know, I think several applications Applications. It's not just manufacturing, right? It can be in really any application with statistics, right? Is that you need clean and organized data. Um, and especially when you have big data, right? That's very hard to do. Um, so, you know, with images, for instance, that is essentially the data because images are comprised of pixels. And so, you know, the more images you have, the bigger your data set gets. So, um, ours was quite large with the images that we were taking. So making sure that the images are clean, the samples are clean prior to imaging was really important. Um, so. so the example that I'm using today is on plates. So the reason I chose plates is because Corning actually used to own Corel and like Corningware. They no longer own that, but I'm sure that Many of you probably have like Corel plates or Corningware um, or Pyrex. So all of that was made by Corning early on. Um, so I thought it might be sort of clever to use plates. Um, so, so again, this isn't the actual example um, or what we manufacture today. It was just, um, I thought it lined up pretty well. So the idea is, you know, imagine you're ma manufacturing plates and you have a measurement system that takes pictures of the plates to assess the paint quality early in the process. So you wanna make sure that when the, paint, the plates get painted, that you know, the quality is very good, there's no streaking or you know, um, the, you know, the paint dried well, all of that. Um, so after the step of painting the plates, the plates are fired in a kiln which is a several day process before they ship to a customer. So, you know, the measurement system early in the process before, you know, the plates get fired for several days and sent to a customer, it's very important that we have clean data early in the process. Um, so that if we have to go back and look at that data for some reason, you know, it's not contaminated um, in any way, so. So sometimes the plates, you know, might collect dust or debris prior to imaging or firing, um, which is why sample prep is really important. So what sample prep should be done? So I'll go to that on the next slide here for sample prep. But this is just, you know, an example of if you had dirty plates versus clean plates. So the ones on the left here are probably dirty. Um, I just put, you know, pictures of plates that someone ate off of just as a demonstration. Um, but imagine, you know, if you're manufacturing them, it would really be like dust or debris that might get on them before you, you would take an image of it. Um, and then the clean plates are obviously, you know, you can see the surface really well. You can make sure the paint quality is really well on the plate. Um, so if you were to take a picture of the clean plates, they obviously look different than the dirty plates. So the dirty plates may make you um, make a different decision in when you're manufacturing if they aren't prepped well enough. So. so the sample prep procedure, um, so prior to imaging the samples, technicians are asked to blow the plates off with an air hose so that there's no dust or debris on the surface. So this down here on the right is sort of demonstrating that process. So just imagine like plates coming through and technicians are asked to blow the plates off. Um, so after the sample prep, the technicians would image the parts on a measurement system with a camera and the images and data are saved for a period of time. And this is because if there is a customer complaint or customer recall or something on you know, the plates, they said that the paint quality was bad, right, then, you know, engineering would take the action to pull this data from when the plates were made early on to see what went wrong with the paint quality, you know, was there chipping, was it not, was it streaking, you know, what was the problem, so. So the problem is, is that 
we have no guarantee that the samples are clean. So we ask technicians to blow the plates off, um, but we don't really know if they actually blow the plates off. So, um, and what you'll learn in manufacturing is that, you know, there are some technicians, right, that we know do not spend time pressing the samples very well. Um, so they don't understand the importance of it, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I've dealt with this all my years at Corning so far, which is only like four. Um, but, you know, if you go back to look pool data or look at data and it's, you know, dirty and, you know, they weren't prepped very well, well, then you're going to make wrong decisions, and that data you pretty much just have to throw away. Um, so the question was, was you know, how can we implement an automatic detection method of clean samples in our imaging process? So, so then now I'm going to go into, you know, that's sort of our question. We want an automatic procedure that would make sure the parts are clean before they are imaged on this measurement system. So what statistical technique, you know, should we go with here? So I've listed some important questions that I found when working on this project um, that I felt like are important in order to make a decision on what statistical technique you should use. So, so the first one is, is what specific questions are you trying to answer? Or maybe it's an objective that you're trying to solve, so either one. So like I said, you know, earlier, our objective is to make sure that the parts are prepped accordingly, that, you know, we have data integrity, um, human error, right, is whether it's intentional or malicious, right, is, you know, sort of a, a way to go wrong with data integrity is through human error. So we're trying to rule out that, that human error aspect of it, right, and make it automatic. Um, so that was really the goal. Um, what kind of data do you have available is the second question here. And is there additional data that needs to be collected? Um, so what kind of data do we have? So we have images, right, the measurement system that we're using to take images of the plate to check for the paint quality. You know, is there additional data that needs to be collected? Um, for this application, there wasn't really any additional data. Um, that needed to be collected for the automatic procedure, so I would say no in our case. Um, but definitely in other cases, you know, the data that you have may not be sufficient for the questions you're trying to answer. So, um, is your data clean and organized, or will you need to do some pre-processing? So this is definitely very, very important. Um, like. I mentioned early on, you know, data needs to be clean and organized even when you're building a model, right? Um, so one of the biggest struggles that I've had, which I'll get to the machine learning aspect in a minute, is just making sure that our data is not contaminated in any way. So if we call like an image a good image versus a bad image, right, like a clean plate versus a dirty plate image, then, you know, we don't want contamination in our data set. We don't want bad and the good, and we don't want good and the bad, because if you have that, then the model's just going to get confused on uh, when it goes to predict new data that it's never seen. So, you know, really this is the key is that your data is clean and organized very well, um, or, you know, do you need to do some pre-processing? So I normally check my data set several times to make sure that you know, the data types are right. I don't have missing data where I, you know, unless it's explainable. Um, so, you know, this is definitely probably the most important question here. Um, so, and I will say that this, this step right here, number three of making sure that it's clean and organized and sorted um, appropriately, you know, it's really like 75, 80% of the time I spend when you build machine learning models. Um, so it's, you know, a good portion of the time and then actually training the model or any statistical model, right, is usually pretty quick. Um, you might want to try some different techniques, but overall it's the quickest of everything, so. 
Um, so the fourth question is, do you care about prediction or inference? So this one is also, um, so we'll get to this in a second on, um, so if you don't really care about it, you might choose a different statistical technique than if you were to care about it. So like regression or something, you know, you can build predictive modeling, you know, models from regression. So, you know, that might be a technique you would use if you do care about it. If you don't care about prediction or inference and you're just looking for like patterns in your data um, that you already have, then you might choose something like clustering um, as an example, uh, where it would really just separate out your data into clusters. So more to come on this, but it is an important question because if you do care about prediction or inference of future data, then you may choose a different statistical technique. So. And then the fifth question is, is, does this need to be automatic or could it be ran offline? So what I mean by this is like, for instance, in the plate example, the plate manufacturing example, is we do need it to be automatic. So we want it to check prior to them scanning the plates on the image, the imaging system. Um, so we do need it to be automatic and built into software um, rather than being Great offline in like an outside statistical software package like Jump or R or something like that, where maybe an engineer can run the model offline on their PC, you know, in their office, for instance, versus does it need to be more automatic and like ingrained in the process? So, so those are really the key questions that I've had through, like I said, throughout this application. Um, that I'm talking about today. So. so now I'm going to get into what is machine learning. So um, if you if you haven't guessed already, the approach that we took is machine learning. Um, it's actually a you know a subset of machine learning called deep learning. Um, but I figured I would start out with what is machine learning overall and. Machine learning is one of these terms that you know has like definitely gained popularity. I feel like and can even be like somewhat overused like everybody's really excited to you know try machine learning which is great but it's definitely not you know the route that you should take every single time right it's only if the question you're trying to answer or the objective you're trying to solve if it makes sense for that sample case um so and then the other thing is is that machine learning you know, encompasses a lot of different techniques, right? So like regression or classification or um, clustering, you know, stuff like that that we already had sort of statistical techniques for, that, that stuff is still considered like machine learning. So, so the Wikipedia definition that I pulled is, you know, machine learning, learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and by use of the data, um, which, you know, sounds a lot like statistics, right? So um, the two types of machine learning, so there's unsupervised and there's supervised. Um, so unsupervised just means that there's no Y labels. So for our example with the plate, we split our data into good and bad, or like clean and dirty. So we have a set of you know, images where the plates are clean, and we have a set of images where the plates are dirty. So ours is actually supervised machine learning because we have a Y label. We have good and bad or clean and dirty. Um, if you, if we didn't have Y labels, so say we just, we threw away the fact that we knew they were good and bad and randomized this whole set of images, right? You could do unsupervised provide machine learning in that case. And really the, the, the two main ones that I've used are k-means clustering and principal component analysis. But, you know, I think a lot of people with statistics background knows a lot about principal component analysis. So that's another example of where that is considered like machine, under the machine learning umbrella, but it's definitely a statistical technique from, you know, way back when, right? So. Um, so some examples of supervised machine learning are like, hey, nearest neighbors, 
that's a pretty easy one. That's why I threw that one in there. Um, regression, so like linear logistic regression, um, decision tree, and neural networks. So um, the neural network, that's the one that we'll be focusing on for this application here. Um, so uh, in specific, specifically, it's convolutional neural networks, which are really good with images. Um, so it's, a, it's a more of a deep learning under machine learning technique. So, so common terms. So we have labels, which is really the thing that we're predicting. So in our case, our label is clean or dirty. So that's like our Y label, which I mentioned a minute ago. Um, our features are input variables. So in our case, it's pixels from an image. So you know, an image of a plate is comprised of a bunch of pixels. And in our case, we have color images, which make a pretty big difference because those images are comprised of like RGB, which is red, green, blue. Um, so it's actually like three layers instead of having a black and white image um, like or a grayscale image, which is really just one layer of pixels. We have RGB images, which actually make things more complicated. Um, they're, they're color images versus grayscale. So, um, so that's our feature in this example. But you know, and you get that the features are like your X variables, so your input variables. Um, training. So training is just creating or learning a model. And inference is applying the trained model to unlabeled examples. So typically you have like a test data set, which you use where it was never used in training the model. It's just reserved for after you've built a model and you feel pretty good about it, you run this test data set through and you assess the accuracy at that point because it's data that the model's never seen before. So that's what you really want to know is how well the model's doing with data that it's never seen before. So. Um, regression, so regression is predicting continuous values and classifications, predicting categorical values. Um, clustering is unsupervised learning technique that groups data into clusters based on patterns. So this is actually pretty cool. I've recently done just a couple like offline examples with like k-means clustering um, on images. So it does actually work with images but it really just groups the images into um, into clusters based on the patterns that it's observing. Um, so you know, I haven't yet found a way to really do like prediction with clustering. I don't know if that's that's a thing or not. You can usually stack machine learning techniques on top of one another too, um, where you might use you know a couple depending on what question and objective you're trying to solve. So I put these little discussions in the presentation. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, I wanted to try to break it up from me talking the entire time. So, um, you know, maybe I'll just ask, I don't know if anyone wants to share any machine learning models that you've used or if you're familiar with machine learning. Um, so maybe I'll just see if anybody has any comments to that discussion prompt and then if not, we can, we can continue on. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Or if you have a comment, you can put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, we can also maybe discuss at the very end of the presentation, too, so that works. Um, okay. So, like I mentioned, um, you know, the the one that I chose to go with is, is convolutional neural networks. Um, so this actually should be convolutional, um, so or CNN for short. Um, so this is a really useful technique um, in the last few years for image classification. Uh, so again, the, our features here are the images, but they're really actually the pixels 
uh, right, because images are comprised of pixels. So those are really our features in this case. Um, you know, when a computer sees an image, right, it doesn't sort of see the same thing that we see. It sees a bunch of numbers, right, in a long vector. Um, so all those numbers represent the different pixels. And like I said before, if you have colored images like this one here, you know, it's really comprised of an RGB. So it's essentially three layers on top of one another. So. Um, so our features are the images and our labels are good or bad. So our good case is clean and our bad case is dirty. So like you see here, so this plate, you know, didn't have any debris on it. Um, it was nice and clean. So this would be what you would want to take an image of. Whereas this image is bad. So it has definitely has debris on here, um, like old food or something. So you wouldn't want to take a picture of this because you know, that's just going to be bad data. Um, so, so usually you need several thousand images for each class. So this can depend on how much variation in your data that you have. Um, so what I mean by this is, you know, you really have to understand what kind of products or samples you make and how much variation within those samples you might have. Um, so if we're talking about plates here, um, you know, if we only train images on white plates, like we showed below, then the CNN would have a hard time deciding, you know, is a green plate bad or good? Because it's never seen a green plate in your training data before. Um, so, you know, what other watchouts are there? So there would be like shape of plate maybe. Like, you know, we have square plates or, you know, rectangle plates or, you know, I'm sure there's other other kinds of shapes. Um, color is another one, um, you know, maybe design, um, size of the plate. So all of these things you have to <clears throat> really understand before you collect your training data, because you want to make sure that your training data covers all of these aspects. Um, so that's definitely very important. And like I mentioned um, earlier, on the slide with the questions that we went through, um, you know, making sure the data is not contaminated in any way. So you really want a bad set of images. So at say I had 10,000 images in the bad set and 10,000 in the good set, um, which is close to what I actually had in my application just to cover all of my, my different samples that I make. Um, you know, I want to make sure that there's no good images in my bad data set, and I want to make sure there's no bad images in my good data set. Um, so, you know, the sorting of the images is very important. So, and I will say that's the part that nobody wants to do. <laughs> so, right, so if you have 20,000 images like I had here, you know, no one finds it fun, right, to like look through it images to the plate stay all day long and make sure that you know everything that is bad is bad and everything that is good is good or you know when you first start out with an application um, and you're just collecting data you have to actually mainly sort that right unless you do some kind of clever like clustering method or something like that someone has to spend the time manually sorting um, so that's definitely one thing that I struggled with, um, and I usually am the one that ends up stuck with this, um, just because I want to get to the fun machine learning stuff, right? Um, but uh, but sorting is definitely uh, necessary. So so um, so now just talking really briefly about actually the CNN code, um, so you guys can maybe. If you've never heard of CNN, you know, you can maybe do some research offline, try it with just a few images, right? There's several articles on, like, dogs versus cats, for instance. Um, so some basic, like, Python code. So, you know, a couple of questions to ask yourself before you code up, like, CNN, is what programming, what programming language do you want to choose? So um, I mainly use Python. Um, used R just a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, and then I'm sure there's other programming languages like C Sharp or Java or stuff like that that you might could use to, 
to code out the CNN. I think from what I think Python is probably the most popular, um, but uh, and it's also R and Python are both free, so you can download those on your PC and try those out. Um, so the next question is, is how many samples do you need? Um, so uh, you really need thousands of images in order to do this and to create a good model. Um, if you wanted to just try something pretty quickly, you know, you could maybe do 100 and 100 just to see what it gives you. Like if you had dogs versus cats, you might be able to get away with doing like 100 and 100, right? But if you had like dogs and wolves or something like that, that looked very, you know, much more, you know, closer together, then you might have to, um, you might have to collect more samples. So, um, so also, you know, are the samples sorted correctly to go or bad? And we don't want any contamination. So, I feel like I've said that a lot, but definitely important um, to take away. So, um, what framework do you want, you know, to choose? So, the toys that I had were either TensorFlow or Keras for CNN. Um, so, TensorFlow was developed first, um, and then Keras came later. And Keras actually is built on top of TensorFlow, so it uses a lot of, um, it uses TensorFlow actually, you know, underneath the hood um, for doing that. And it's a lot less lines of code using Keras, but um, definitely just do your research on, you know, how this is working compared to TensorFlow. <clears throat> there was actually one point on our application that none of us thought of where we actually had to go back to TensorFlow. We couldn't use Keras because the C Sharp environment, which we were also using for the measurement equipment, um, wasn't able to handle Keras. So we actually had to go back and rewrite a lot of the code in using TensorFlow because that was something that C Sharp had integrated into its, its software. So, you know, definitely be flexible and do your research first um, and sort of map out, you know, how everything's going to work. So if you're, if you're more making this like a pipeline, like an automatic procedure like I was. So, so what hyperparameters are important? So like hyperparameters in a model, right, include there's just a couple listed here, learning rate and batch size. So these are things that you want to, you know, maybe change to improve your model. Um, so like learning rate is really part of like gradient descent. So finding like a global minimum, like what's your step size essentially is like learning rate. Um, and then batch size is like how many samples do you have and there's usually rules for like batch size is you want it to be like 32 or 64 or some factor like that. Um, so these are hyperparameters that you may have to end up changing in order to improve your model. So it's important to understand how they work. So. And then, you know, the last piece of really the code is how well does our model Perform. So a couple things for CNNs are, you know, definitely accuracy, precision. Um, so, you know, precision, like how well does our model do at, you know, making correct choices? And accuracy is how many times did I predict correct out of the total number of times? That's essentially accuracy, which you can get from a confusion matrix. If you're familiar with confusion matrices, they list out um, I should have included a, an example here of a confusion matrix, but it's essentially like a two-by-two two table of, that shows your misclassification. So when did I predict bad, but it was actually good? And when did I predict good, and it was actually bad? So it's predicted versus actual. Um, so really your accuracy comes from how many times was I correct, right? I predicted good, and it was good. Our predicted image was bad, and it was bad. So that's where the accuracy comes from. And then misclassifications are also important. So those samples that you have in those two buckets, the predicted good, actually bad, and the predicted bad, actually good, you want to understand what from those images is my model not liking, right? 
So were those images, for example, all green plates, right? And you had just trained a model on white plates. That might be where, you know, you can get an idea of where is my model sort of going wrong, right? Um, is misclassification. So, and then add those in or collect more samples around those and then just retrain the model um, on the new data. So, and then the last technique, which I actually like a lot, um, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, is called valency mapping. Um, I think there's other terms also, maybe Lime, I've heard. Um, but the idea with valency mapping is um, what is my CNN actually doing, right? So a lot of times with convolutional neural nets, it just seems like a black box. Like, right, I feed it good images and I feed it bad images. And, you know, how is it actually distinguishing between the two, right? Like what's going on? So valency mapping gives you an idea of what it's picking out in the images. So here's just an example of you have some original images here. And what is it actually looking at, right? So the saliency mapping portion of it um, is you can see it's picking out like the boat here. So it's it sort of draws like a heat map almost of, you know, what pixels are in my image that it's finding important, essentially. So this one, it found sort of the boat. This one, you can see it found the items on the sink. And then the last one, that looks like Stonehenge. So, it, you know, it looks like it found that correctly, too. So this just gives you an idea. Is it actually, you know, finding the debris on our plate um, when it's training our model? Um, there's a famous example, actually, with this, with um, dogs versus, uh, or it's wolves versus huskies. Um, so that's actually a pretty cool example. I think I have it listed in the references in my presentation. If you want to take a look after, but um, pretty much there's uh, a machine learning model that was trying to distinguish husky versus wolves, and it actually had a really high accuracy. So everybody got excited that hey, we can distinguish, you know, a wolf in a picture versus a husky. But it, what it was actually picking up on was the background of the image, right? Because wolves are mostly in snow and huskies are mainly in, you know, people yards, right, as pets. So it was actually picking up the background of the image and it wasn't picking up the actual animal. Um, so it, they discovered this through saliency mapping on what was actually being picked up in the images. And it came back as the background of the image versus what was, you know, what they thought it was, it was um, looking at, so. So, um, so the next thing is prediction. So say we've written all of our CNN code, we have a really good model, it has, you know, good accuracy, it doesn't overfit, it's not memorizing our data in any way, um, which I didn't really talk about here, but is also important for when you, when you train a model that it doesn't overfit or memorize your training data. Um, so say we have a good model, right? The next step is prediction. So, um, you know, the way prediction works is usually it's, it's definitely wise to have a testing data set. So I talked about this earlier, a testing data set where the model has never seen this data before and how well is it going to predict on it? So before before we roll any model out in manufacturing, we always, you know, put test data sets through to see how well it's going to do. Um, so our current model is used in production today. Um, and so the, the way it works is that we pretty much fault the machine within a few seconds if the sample is not prepped appropriately. Um, so the way it works is it'll take the image and then we run that image through our CNN model, and our CNN model will say this is a good or a bad image. So if it's bad, then we actually fault the machine within a few seconds of scanning, saying that it's not prepped appropriately. Um, so this helps us prevent, you know, data going into 
like a database or something where it was bad data. So before we never had anything to tell us that. So this is definitely stopping the fact of writing data or writing images out um, when we don't want them. So. so our measurement equipment software is written in C sharp. And so you can actually embed like model files into the software in order to do inference. So, you know, a lot of the software packages, right, you can use, use like a combination of the two, right? So C Sharp and Python, um, you know, you can't integrate the two depending on what you want to do. But a watch out for that, which I found out sort of the hard way is that, you know, C Sharp didn't handle the Keras framework very well, but it does handle TensorFlow a lot better. So, um, so just those are sort of the watch out when you um, when you're like integrating software like that to make sure that what you're trying to do will work. So so um, then just extending this problem. So there's a couple more things that we're sort of working on with the application. So unfortunately, we can't save images from every piece or for every sample. Um, because they are very large. So there's several gigs per image. So it's not uh, very, you know, IT does not like the fact that they need a big storage solution for all of these images, right? So we need more of a longer term solution on saving images. So something like maybe AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, like a cloud where it's, you know, long term, like cold storage. Um, so, um, standardization, so this is another really important one for me, is using the same machine learning model for future applications of CNN. So, you know, it, it's definitely not the case where you might can use the same model across several platforms, but you can use pretty much the same framework if you code it up, you know, correctly and you standardize it. So, you know, this machine learning model, even though it was for bad or good plates in manufacturing, it might be used for a completely different application, right? You know, we could try dogs versus cats with the machine learning model that we built. Um, so it's just standardization of, of code pretty much. And I do mention, you know, this would obviously require some tweaks depending on the data you have. So, and then the last one is uh, model maintenance. So when would our model need to be updated? So this is a pretty, you know, popular discussion topic for a lot of statistical techniques, right, is how do we maintain our model? Um, so that if we do get, like, new data, we start making a completely new plate in manufacturing that we've never seen before, you know, we're going to have to update our model somehow so that it knows what those plates look like. So, so examples of when your model might need to be updated are like manufacturing a new type of sample, um, debris on the samples change. So if you no longer have like dust, debris, or old food, but you have like new debris from some, you know, something, then you would have to retrain your model. And then the other one is like equipment changes. So if you make a change to like the hardware, like you go with a different camera that takes different sized images, um, or even like software changes, right? You want to change the the size of your image, or you want to change, you know, it to be like grayscale images or colored images or something like that, right? All of these, you would have to retrain a, a model. So. So then I, I just had another discussion here too, so maybe we can leave this for the end here. But, you know, has anyone had any challenges with data or image storage and what was your resolution? So, so this is a problem that we face a lot is just how long do we save data for images? Um, so. so that actually concludes my presentation. So um, if there's any questions, um, feel free to ask. Um, I had a question, and I'll give, it'll give everybody a, a minute or two to write their questions into the chat. Um, 
when you have different kinds of samples, like with your example of the plates, if you had, you know, green square plates and white round plates, do you usually put those together in the same model or do you ever separate those into two different models? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I'm in the process of actually trying both right now with my actual application. So it would be ideal if you could just train one model, like one model fully, right, that had everything in it. Um, and it would distinct, you know, it would classify them correctly. Um, you know, right now with the plate example, for instance, I am training separate models per plate. So I would train a separate model for like white round plates versus green square plates. But I think that it would work under one model. You just have to have the correct balance, right? So that's the other thing I don't think I mentioned too much is balance of the data set. So like you wouldn't want, you know, your model to just be on a thousand white images and like 10 green images, 10 green plates, right? Um, because that, you know, that's unbalanced. So, so maybe you had a thousand white, a thousand green, a thousand blue, right? You want to make sure that each type is represented um, and it's balanced. So. So that's a good question. Yeah, try both. Okay. Um, I haven't gotten any other questions, so I think we'll end for today. Thanks so much for your presentation. It was really great. And thanks to everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, um, you can respond to the email you'll get from me and um, we'll find out how to answer your questions. Thanks so much. Yep, thanks everybody. Thanks. Sir.